We're so glad that you've tuned into our Rolling Hills Community Church Sermon Podcast. I'm Patrick Hamilton, the campus pastor of ministries and interim kids pastor at Rolling Hills Community Church's Nashville campus. Today we're continuing our Advent series. In today's sermon, Pastor Jacob will be teaching from Luke 1, focusing on the theme of love and God's ultimate display of love in sending His Son, Jesus. Now, here's Jacob. This Christmas, just like each one before, we celebrate. But not because of the gifts, not because of the songs. We celebrate because love came down to give hope for the future. Love came down to grant peace to anxious minds. Love came down to teach us how to love one another. Love came down to show us where to find true joy. Love came down with Jesus. Love came down for you. Good morning, church. My name is Jacob Scrimshaw. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Rolling Hills. And, you know, recently my wife and I and my whole family, we took a trip. It was about a six hour trip. And when we were getting in the car, getting ready to come back home, we knew there was going to be a little bit of rain, but we were like, hey, we need to get home. Let's just, let's just drive. So we got on the road and almost as soon as we got on there, I mean, it started pouring. It, I mean, it was pouring rain. Like pretty much every rain that Forrest Gump talks about happened at one time in this moment. Like it was all dropped down. It was one of those rains where you're driving 35 miles an hour. You got the flashers on. You're up on the steering wheel like this, kind of looking like, are we going to make this? Are we going to make it? I mean, it was the least amount of visibility I can ever remember for the longest period of time driving. And as we start out on the trip, we're, we're starting. It's, it's pretty bad. My kids are trying to talk to me. And I was like, nope, nope, dad's focused. Let me stop talking. Nobody talk. So I'm focused on the road and I tell my wife, I was like, Shannon, show me the radar. I need to see the radar. And she's like, why are you always talking about the radar? So I had to stop and give her uh, some information about dad life. That once you become a father and dad, there's two jobs that you take on. One of them is monitoring the radar at all times. You got to know what's going on there. And then um, being the monitor over the thermostat. Those two things happen. So I'm always like, don't touch the thermostat, show me the radar. Don't touch the thermostat, show me the radar. That's just, that's just how I roll. Even to when like we were playing in the Sounds of Christmas event, I was the dad in the room. We were talking about, oh yeah, that'll be awesome. I was like, whoa, 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 let me check the radar. So I was the guy, radar guy. So I, I want to see the radar because I want to see what we really have in front of us. And as I'm looking at it, we've just started the trip and I can see we're in the middle of red as we, I mean, it's red. And then I was like, okay, how far does the red go? And it goes forever. We're basically driving on a line of red, red behind us, red in front of us. And I was like, keep, keep pulling out. I need to see. And what I wanted to see was the edge of the green. I knew that once you get out of the red, you get into the green. And what I needed to see was the edge of the green. Because as you're driving, and I knew that it was going to be about three hours of driving in the rain like this. There was no pulling over, it just had to go forward. And why I wanted to see the edge of the rain because I needed to be reminded what the radar was promising me was this will end at some point. The radar is telling me that every storm has a green edge and I needed to see that green edge so I could have hope that would push me forward to that moment when I would get to the edge. And the reason I tell you this story is because where we are in Luke, in our series going forward, we are nearing the green edge. All of creation is groaning for the storms to end. All of the world is groaning for this green edge because like the radar is the promise that one day the storm will end. What we see here today is we are nearing the promise the promise that the storms of this world would end, the promise that love would win, and the promise that love would come down. Because like you heard in the song, when love comes down, it changes everything. And God will show us what that means in the text today. Let's pray, Father, as we dive into your word, Lord, open our hearts for full understanding. Give us clarity of what this word means and how it applies to our life and how we can follow you more closely through what we read here in your holy word. And we ask this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 
We're going to be in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 39. You can read along with me in your Bible. It will be on the screen as well. This is what the Word of God says. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried down to, notice she hurried down to the town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Lord shall come to me? As soon as I heard the sound of your greeting reach my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord will fulfill promises to her. I'll give you some context of over the past uh, two weeks we've been in this series and Pastor Jeff introduced us to Elizabeth and we talked about the miracle of her birth, her barren birth and then Pastor T introduced us last week to Mary and the miracle of her virgin birth. So what you have is like you're watching a movie, you see two characters introduced and then you're like, how are they gonna connect? So right now we see the plot connection of the two. We see the miraculous conception of Elizabeth and the miraculous conception of Mary and here they are crossing paths. And what I don't want us to miss here is the beautifulness of this two miracles crossing paths in this text. What you have is John the Baptist who would be the one who points to the way. He would make the straight path for Jesus. He was the one pointing to the way and then Jesus the way. And what you see is these two miracle conceptions meeting in utero, which is just amazing to me to think about this moment. And in this moment, what you could argue is this is Jesus's first appearance as a per, his personhood here in this text of Mary, who is with child, coming to Elizabeth that is with child. And I want to show you something really quick. Like when you think about it, it's easy to just cross past this and like, okay, Jesus was in Mary. She, he was in the womb. But think about this. In Philippians 2, Scripture says that Jesus became a person and was obedient to death, even death on a cross. We know that's how the story ends, but something for us to ponder on for a second is, before Jesus humbled himself to the cross, he humbled himself to a womb. Before he humbled himself to the cross, he humbled himself to the womb. Before he was obedient to death, he was obedient to birth. Before he was obedient to death, he was obedient to conception. And we can't remind ourselves in this Christmas season how many times we could say it is that Jesus could have come as a king riding in high. Like we read in Revelation, Jesus comes on the back of a horse with might and authority. He could have come on high and instead he came in the belly of a teenage girl. He humbled himself to the womb. And look, when she, when she hurries to Elizabeth, look what happens in verse 41 when he comes to Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, it doesn't say what she said because it's not important. He, she greeted him and look what happened. The baby leaped in Elizabeth's womb when Jesus drew near. When Jesus, the first appearance of Jesus' personhood, the first response we see is worship. John the Baptist kicks and leaps with joy. And we've all experienced this. If, you, if you've ever tried to talk to a baby in, in the stomach, you're talking to it, you're like, hey, buddy, can you hear me? And then you feel it kick, and you're like, he heard me. We know it's real. They, they, they hear you. Like, you respond to kick. It's like, he, he heard me. And this is what we see happening here. Not just he heard me. It's not just a response of a baby. It says he leaped with joy. He worshiped with his kick. You know, and for us, my family, we, we've had four children. Our, our first child was diagnosed at 20 weeks with a genetic disorder where um, we knew that he probably wouldn't live a year past birth. But they told us, like, that the safest place for him is, is in the womb. Like, he will have his longest, best life probably in the womb, enjoy that time together. So when I would talk to Elijah and I would feel him kick against my hand, I can still feel the pressure of his kick against my hand and every kick that he gave because the kicks were all that we had led me to worship. Every time he kicked, it led me to worship God and the grace for those moments. And the reason I tell you that story is because when we see the first response of Jesus drawing near is worship, that baby's kick should kick us into worship. 
that how convicting it is that a baby in utero is in worship when we struggle to worship. But what should happen? We should read this and we should respond in worship. Look how look what it does to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, it kicks her into worship. It says, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, "Blessed is the woman and the child that you will bear." She, she not does she worship. She worships in a loud voice. She proclaims loudly to Mary in worship to God. And what she's doing here is think about this. So Mary is with the angel before this. She's with, and the angel speaks the word of the Lord to her. She hears it and she responds in obedience. She responds in obedience, which responding in obedience is worship, but she hears it and she responds. Then she hurries into the presence of Elizabeth. Elizabeth confirms what Jesus has said and she starts to worship and then she starts to speak this truth back to Mary to respond. This is what the Lord has told you. He's told me the same thing and she is affirming because God always acts like this. What God speaks in solitude, he affirms in community. What God speaks in solitude, he affirms in community. Mary was with the angel. She, God spoke to her in solitude. She comes into community with Elizabeth and God affirms what was said. And the same is true with, with us. God desires for us to have solitude with him. God desires us. The reason why we do here at Rolling Hills Daily Step is a Bible reading plan that we're all doing together. We're getting ready to uh, put it out for 2021 of what we'll be walking through. But we do that not just so you have another thing to do. It's because one of the most important steps you can take during the day is taking a moment, stopping, and starting your day with being in solitude with the Lord and reading his word, and God will speak to you through his word. And what happens is, a lot of times when we're reading the word, when I'm reading the word, I was like, I don't understand what I just read, but what God does, the way he modeled for us to understand more and to comprehend more of his word is to be in community. That's why we do community groups, not just because churches should have small groups, because we believe small groups is biblical. Jesus hung out with a small group of disciples and they understood more and more together because what happens is you read the word alone. You're like, Lord, I understand this in part. Well, let me go to community. Hey, I didn't really understand what this meant. I didn't either. Let's look at it together because God designed community to grow us and grow our understanding because what happens is when we say, okay, I, the word tells me to love people. Okay, I, I know I should, but I don't really understand how to do that. You get in community and you see people loving other people and you learn how to love others more well. God affirms in community what he speaks in solitude. And then just think about this. The most cosmos altering event in history is nurtured in the most ordinary way, simply being together. What was Jesus's birth Life and death is the most cosmos altering event in history. And how does God nurture this to worship? By Elizabeth and Mary just being together. And I know when you see that simply being together, you know how real that is. After the year that we've been through, we know the importance, the power of us simply being together. Because oftentimes we want these huge God moments. We want God to move in this miraculous way. And sometimes the way he moves in us and moves in our life is by simply being together with other believers. Because like when you think about this, the simply being together, God designed us for this being together. We were all created for this type of community. For us to grow in communion with one another. We're in this room to be with each other. We're watching online to be with other believers. We're, we're gathering together by the Spirit so that we could be together and grow in the Lord together. That's why we do community groups. But that's also like when we are looking at a text as a staff, we have a teaching team. You know what we do? We sit in a room together, all the people on the teaching team. Pastor Jeff leads us in that, and we go through the text, and you know what we do? We seek to understand together. We read the word on our own. We come together as a community, and we look at the text, and we seek to understand in community because we know that's how God works is through community. Even in fact, as I was studying this passage, I went to two uh, strong Christian ladies on staff, and I was talking through what God was putting on my heart, and they just were like, hey, when I read this, this is what God affirms in me. 
that Christian women should take care of other Christian women, that we desperately need each other and that I should be taking care of more women. And I understood the text in a different way by being in community with people who are in a different stage of life and a different aspect that I'm looking at. So they helped me understand the text better together. Because look at this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. It is incomparable joy when you're in the presence of other Christians, whether in a room like this or if you're at home with your family, you're in the presence of other believers. If you're in this room, the first time we came back after not being in this room, you can talk to many people that first day, there was this incomparable joy of just being in the presence of other believers. The first time you were ever gathered with your community group again, it was like, I just feel so much joy, happiness, despite the circumstances, because I'm in the presence of other believers. And in fact, it is a incomparable strength that when you sit in a room with other believers like this or a smaller room, you say, I'm not alone. I don't have to do this on my own. I have other people that are going forward together and we can do this together to strength and joy for us. Now, Dietrich, notice he says physical presence. That's because Dietrich B had never been to a Zoom meeting before. He didn't understand how good a Zoom community group can be, right? No, but here's the, here's the deal. It's, it's, it's not even a reasonable facsimile of what it feels like to be in the physical presence of other believers. But if that's what we have to do to be in community, then we'll Zoom all day long if that's what we have to do. If we have to watch online, if we have to, whatever we have to do to gather together because we desperately need each other. If you saw anything in this past season, it will remind you that we desperately need each other. So when you're in this type of community, what does it produce? Let's look at Luke 41, 46. This is Mary responding to Elizabeth. Look how Mary responds. Verse 46, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord or my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. From now, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. Don't miss that. Those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent away the rich empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Side note, where was Joseph during those three months? He was, they just hanging out? He was at home by himself? Anyway, I don't know. So look how Mary responds. She responds community. She's affirmed what God has told her. She's beginning to understand a little more and she responds with worship. The same way that John the Baptist and Elizabeth responds, this is, she responds in worth of it. And what does she say? This is Mary's Magnificat. It's called the Magnificat because it says, I will magnify the Lord. She says, I will magnify the Lord. And it's easy for us to pass over something like that. Yes, I will magnify the Lord. That's good. We should do that. But I think what God would have us do is to stop when Mary says something like, I will magnify the Lord, to stop and ask our que a question, am I magnifying the Lord? Even better, what am I magnifying? Because this is the truth, we all have a war raging inside of us. It's the war of magnification. What are we magnifying? And you may stop and think for a second, well maybe I'm magnifying this, or magnifying that, when it comes down to it, it's really only one or two things. I'm either magnifying the Lord or I'm magnifying Jacob. I'm magnifying myself. It's either yourself or the Lord. Any other avenue you may walk down and say, well, maybe I'm magnifying this, it points back to I wanna make Jacob's name great instead of the Lord's name great. We have this war raging inside of us. We're either magnifying the Lord or ourself. And think about this. Mary knew in part, but she trusted in full. 
Think about this. Mary, a teenage girl, was spoken to the Lord, by the Lord to her and says, here's what's going to happen. She heard it. She understood. She was obedient. She understood in part. She didn't know the fullness of the story. You know, when you sing the song, Mary, did you know? She didn't. She didn't know. She knew in part. But how did she respond? She trusted in full. She knew in part, but trusted in full. Now to us, we know in full, but trust in part. We have something that Mary didn't have. We have something that the prophets long for. We have something, we have the full counsel of God before us. We know the full story. We may not understand the full story, but we know the full story. Mary knew in part, but trusted in full. We oftentimes know in full, but trust in part. And what happens when we trust in part. What happens in our lives when we're trusting in part and not trusting in full with this war of magnification is going on and it usually boils down to this, that we're either seeking to rule as kings and queens or seeking to serve as sons and daughters. Look down in, to verse 51, what Mary says in her song. She's really, she's given us a picture of the gospel before we see Jesus preaching the gospel. She's affirming things that Jesus will say later. She says, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. Every time you see his arm in scripture, it's his righteous right arm. It's when God is moving in scripture, his righteous right arm. And he has scattered the thoughts that are proud in their innermost thoughts. They're proud in their inner thoughts. And he has brought down rulers from their thrones. Think about this, like Mary is talking about that God has the power to bring down physical rulers. But she's saying that the proud aren't the ones that are on the thrones, they're the ones that are on the throne of their own heart. It is the innermost pride. It is the ones that are seeking to rule as kings and queens. Is us with our war of magnification, are we magnifying ourself? And the truth is we cannot serve, we cannot understand, we cannot grow until we step down as kings and queens and let the Lord take his spot as throne of our own heart. Because Mary says it there, he brought down rulers from the throne and lifted up the humble until we step down so that he can rule and then we can serve as sons and daughters. And think about this, the same power that gave conception to Elizabeth at older age, the same power that can bring life to a barren womb is the same power that brought life to a young girl's womb is the same power that is seeking to work in us to make us sons and daughters to adopt us into his family so we can step down as kings and queens and make us sons and daughters. So when you step back in it, you have the barren birth. It's a miraculous conception that leads to John the Baptist's birth. You have Mary, the miraculous conception leads to the birth of Jesus. But what Mary is pointing to here is a third birth that is just as miraculous. And it's that you and I can be born again. The story, Jesus came in the miraculous birth so that we could also have a miraculous birth to be born again, born again as sons and daughters, not kings and queens to rule over all in life, but as sons and daughters that serve the kingdom. Because think about it like this. Love came down, born of a woman, so that we could be born again of the Spirit. And the same power that did those miraculous things up until this point in scripture is the same power that gives us a second chance. Because that's what our new birth is, a second chance. This is how Tim Keller says it. The new birth is the power that God is gonna use to regenerate the world. So in the future, when he renews the world, he's, gonna, he's renewing creation, the new heaven and new earth. That same power is the power brought into your world in the present. That same future power, that same power that created the world is the power renewing your heart and renewing your mind. It's the same power that can throw down actual kings. It's the same power that wants to destroy the stronghold of sin in my life and in yours. The same power. The 
the same power that brought the one who would point to the way, meeting with the way. And here's the thing about the new birth. When Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life, this is the way to heaven, this is the way to the future, but it also is the way to be in this world now. So if we're here in this room or we're watching online, we're either in one or two places. We either have been born again by the power of God to repent of our sins and live a new life to see the world in a new way, or we're still ruling as kings and queens. It wasn't until I was 24 years old that I stepped down from the throne of my own heart and let Jesus rule, and I began to see the world differently. I began to understand love differently. I began to get in community and see others differently. God used this new birth And this is the truth of it. Wherever you are in this room, whatever you brought in here, no matter what you've done in your life, God, out of love coming down, wants to give you a second chance. A second chance at a new life. A new birth. When we're born again, There's things that come from it. There's there's a a way of life that changes. When we are born again, we are born again to new understanding. We're born again to new understanding. When we sit in the word as born again believers, we have new hearts. We have new eyes. When we wake up and we're in the word, we begin to understand scripture differently. In John 3, 3, Nicodemus is talking to Jesus and he's confused about being born again and And Jesus says this, except a man be born again, he said, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. And we know Jesus is talking about to go to heaven for us to be with our loved ones, for me to be with Elijah, my son who passed away, for me to be with him, I need to be a born again believer by the power of God for me to step down and for Jesus to rule in my life. For me to see the kingdom of God, I must be born again. But at the same time, for me to see the kingdom here and now, Jesus said the kingdom is here and it is now. When we are new believers, we begin to have new understanding. We see him differently in the world. We can see him more actively moving. We can see him moving in our family. We can see him moving in our neighbors. We can see him moving more clearly. We have new hearts and new eyes in the new birth. And we begin to understand others differently. We begin to see our neighbor differently. We begin to have the compassion that Jesus has. In our new birth, we're growing up into Christ's likeness. We begin to see the world the way he did. When Jesus saw people, he was filled with compassion. We begin to have more understanding. And even that, we begin to see the world differently. We begin to see the world, no matter if there's a worldwide pandemic or natural disasters or a disaster in your home, whatever it is, you begin to see it differently because you begin to understand it differently because the Bible says the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but those in new birth, we begin to see the world if we have new understanding. And also what we have is new love. When you became, if you're a new believer in this room, if you're a, you've, You've been born again, you have new loves, your desires change. You begin to desire less of the old self of what you desired and you desire what Jesus desires. You begin to desire different things. You have new loves because the truth is whatever you are magnifying in your life is coming out of what you truly love. And as we begin to grow up in our, in our new birth, we begin to love Jesus more and love the things that he loves. And that is through the power of the new birth that we have these new di- desires, new magnifications magnifications, and also a new purpose. Where our purpose was before we were born again was to magnify Jacob. It was to live for myself, whatever I have to do. Before 24 years old, everything I did in my life was manipulating and pointing to how I can make Jacob great. And then once I stepped down and he became ruler of my life, he gave me a new purpose. John the Baptist, who leaped in worship in his mother's womb when Jesus drew near, the next time John sees Jesus, he says, look, there he is. There's the one I've been telling you about, the one who will take away the sins of his world, of the world. John the Baptist spent his whole life pointing to Jesus, the one who would take away the sins of the world. Our new purpose is no different than John the Baptist to spend all of our life 
living for Jesus, being like Jesus, and pointing others to Jesus. That with the whole of our lives, we point and say, there he is, the one who takes away the sins of the world. Because I 100% believe this. Everybody in this room is placed where they are for a reason. Your neighbors are your neighbors for a reason. Your coworkers are your coworkers for a reason. The people on your kids' baseball team are on there for a reason. Everywhere you go, you're there for a reason because God has put you there as a missionary to point to Jesus, the one who takes away the sins of the world, the one who took away your sins, the one who took away my sins, and also theirs. As we conclude, I wanna say this to you. God knew everything that you would do in your life. He knew it all. And he went to the womb anyway. He knew every sin that I have ever done. And he went to the cross anyway. Do you know why? Because he loved you. He loves me. And that's why love came down. In this story, we see the green edge of the radar. The storm is ending in the world. Well, today, if you've never taken that step to a new life, a new understanding, a new love, a new way of being in the world, I just, please do not go another moment. You may understand in part, but trust Jesus in full today, whether you're at home or in this room. Because love came down to give us all a second chance. Let's pray. Lord, Father, as we sit here today, I pray if anyone has not made the step to follow you, to take hold of the power of life change, to redeem our life from the pit and help us see the world differently, Lord, that no matter what's going on around us, we can find joy in knowing you, joy in community. Lord, I pray. Whoever in this room is struggling with that, Lord, let them make that decision today to step down off the throne and let Jesus rule. And for all of us in this room, Lord, if we are newborn believers, we should be growing. We should be understanding more. We should be in more community. We should be loving more. Lord, help us take that next step in looking like you so that we all see our purpose to make Jesus' name great. The reason we celebrate Christmas is to make your name great. Let us all worship the way John did, by kicking, by Elizabeth, by yelling, whatever we have to do to worship you and praise you for what you have done. And we ask this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you want to learn more about what's going on in the life of Rolling Hills, download our Rolling Hills app or visit our website at rollinghills.church. From there, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date on what's happening and ways you can connect. We're thankful for you.